Would you please remain standing as you are able for the reading of the gospel lesson? Our scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 14. In these verses, Jesus and the disciples are faced with a problem of feeding a large crowd. From the Gospel. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberia. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. All month long, church-wide, we've been looking at healing acts of Christ. And today, as we conclude the Healing Hands sermon series, we turn our attention to the book of John and to its account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And while it's different than some of the other forms of healing, there is something healing and important that happens when people share a meal together. The simple act of breaking bread together holds such power, and it's something that seems to transcend time and culture. This has been a way to be hospitable and to connect with people forever. This was true in the time of Jesus, and it is still true today. The miracle in the text today is really important. In fact, it's the only miracle of Jesus that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. And each Gospel writer reveals important details about Christ, about his nature and his identity in their own rendition of the story. Here in the book of John, our passage for today starts with, after this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Well, that this, which just happened, is that Jesus healed a man at the pool in Bethesda on the Sabbath, and he was challenged for it by the Jewish authorities in the temple in Jerusalem. And their challenges were answered with this discourse from Jesus that has great theological weight. It's a discussion in which Jesus claimed his authority as equal to that of God the Father, and he claimed God the Father as his Father. And this clearly did not sit well with the Jewish authorities, and it heightened the conflict between them and Jesus. And in addition to this man at the pool in Bethesda, Jesus had been healing people throughout the region. And we read that because of this, a large crowd kept following him. So Jesus retreated to the other side of the sea, and he journeyed up a mountain, and he sat there with his disciples. And from this vantage point, he could see the scene as 5,000 families began coming toward him. The text counts 5,000 men only so that we know that it was many thousands more when we include the women and the children. 
And Jesus saw this great multitude getting closer. And when Jesus saw them, he immediately saw their great need. He turned to Philip, testing, asking, so where are we going to get the food for all these people? A question well suited for Philip because he was from Bethsaida, which is a nearby area. But Philip saw the impossibility of the task before them. They could spend more than six months' salary and still not satisfy the hunger of the crowd. I heard Miss Cindy say it was four months, and maybe that's just salary, you know, equal pay. Um, but it was a huge sum of money. And even with all that money, it would only get a fraction of what they needed. Andrew, too, seems to have been assessing the situation and taking inventory. There's a boy, he said, with five barley loaves and two fish. Barley loaves and dried fish. This was the traveling food of the poor. Those who could afford it ate bread of wheat. But barley loaves were the simple staple of the poor. This was humble sustenance, and there was so little of it. Andrew asked, what are they among so many people? Last week, we talked about how the crowds gathered to experience healing from Jesus. And if you were here, you might remember that we asked people to share their own stories of healing, to write on these little cards how they had experienced the restorative presence of God in their lives. And I preached the Mosaic and the Foundry services last week, so I had the privilege of reading and praying over many of those stories. It was overwhelming. It was really, really powerful to read how God had shown up in places of hurt to heal bodies and relationships, to free people from addictions, both ones that we might see as big and ones that we might see as not so big, to heal aches of all kinds. And some of these stories were huge. You know, you could easily recognize them as mountaintop kinds of moments. And some of them were so simple. They were simple acts of healing that made all the difference for one person. It's hard to realize that we can be in community with each other, spending time with our neighbors and our friends, even here worshiping at church, and not know what they are suffering and what they need healing from, how hungry people are for peace and restoration. Our society encourages us to always present lives that are Instagram ready, right? No trouble, no hurt, just smiling faces. Jesus looked out at the masses and he knew that they were hungry. That they were hungry for more than bread and fish. That they were hungry for the bread of life. Today, we might relate more to Andrew and Philip because despite how hard we're trying to fake it and appear like everyone and everything is okay, we see the seemingly infinite hurts of the world around us. Like these disciples, we might feel so overwhelmed with the need that we're not sure we have anything valuable to offer. In a world with this much need, with this much hurt, how could, would I, how could what I have to contribute ever be enough? We say to ourselves, oh, my, it's so sad. Let's just turn off the news. It's too much. And go about our own business. But look at what Jesus offers here. Look at what he does with the simple gift of a youth, with the unquestioning belief of someone who offers all that he has, humble as it is. Jesus said, make the people sit down. The text tells us that there was a great deal of grass in the place, and it's a detail that's easy to gloss over. Yet there was so much grass that all these people, 5,000 families, could sit. And the Greek word indicates that they reclined, as was the tradition, to recline to eat at the time. So you might imagine this pastoral scene, this green grass in great abundance. This reminds me of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, and of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. We continue in John, Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. 
so also the fish, as much as they wanted. In John's accounting of the miracle, Jesus serves as the host of the meal. He gives thanks, and he distributes the meal himself. Many of the other stories, the disciples do that. Here we're reminded of Psalm 23 again. You prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And the people are offered more than enough. There's such abundance after the feeding that 12 baskets are left over from just five loaves. It's grace upon grace. There is so much hunger in the world. It is too much. Literal hunger and spiritual hunger that we can look at all the brokenness and become almost paralyzed by the magnitude of it, unable to see past our own limitations. But that's missing the point because we cannot serve as Jesus here. Only Jesus can fill that role. We are just called to be like the boy, faithful with what we have, unquestioning if it's enough, but offering it fully. Because it's not about what we have to give. It's about the one who multiplies it. Without Jesus, they all go hungry. Only Jesus can provide the sustenance that satisfies. Only Jesus can fill that hunger, that void, that need that heals and restores us to life. And I don't know about you, but I see the world trying really hard to fill that void with all the other things. We can look around us and know that by and large, most people today are not pounding on the doors of the church, begging to taste a piece of the simple bread that gives everlasting life. No, in increasing number, people are going through the drive through right? They're spilling up on, filling up on spiritual junk food that temporarily numbs the hunger but never really satisfies. Filling up on the shiny and the instantaneous things that make us feel good for a moment. You know, literal junk food, substances, entertainment, other people's praise, power, status. Facebook actually literally calls them status updates. And then we count how many people like it. These things might make us feel whole and satisfied, but for a minute. And we're back to empty. And we can see these temptations in ourselves and look out and see it in the world around us, this hunger and this need for wholeness. Jesus fed the multitudes, and there were 12 baskets left over, so that none may be lost. 12 baskets. That's one for each disciple. The healing power of Jesus Christ still saves. I believe it. It still satisfies and brings wholeness and healing like nothing else can. When Jesus calls himself the bread of life, this is what he means. But we in the church, we have a distribution problem. We have a problem with distribution. Christ offers the grace in abundance. It's grace upon grace. We're not going to run out. Yet we might wonder if what we have to offer, if our story, if our faith, if our testimony is big enough to really make a dent in the spiritual hunger of the world. When I think about food that really satisfies, I think about family recipes. So often, they're about technique as much as ingredients, like my mother-in-law's pie crust that she teaches you how to make by having you touch, you know, how big the crumbles should be when you cut the butter into the flour and how cold the water needs to be. My grandma's chicken and noodles. I have a treasured picture of me as a little girl in the kitchen with my grandma. And it's a big family. I am just one of literally dozens of grandchildren. But there she is with me in the picture, starting the process of passing on the tradition, showing me how to roll out the noodles, how wide to cut them, laying them on towels in the sun to dry. When you prepare those foods for people you love, and when you share those meals together, there's something truly richly satisfying. It exercises an emotional muscle memory. It's nourishing in a distinct way. 
But a lot of those family recipes, they aren't special because they're elaborate, sophisticated recipes. They're so special because someone pulled up alongside you and told you about it. They taught you how to create it for yourself. This is a little like how we can share our stories about how God's grace sustains us to a hungry world. The 5,000 families were satisfied. They were fed with an abundance left to share from the simple food of the poor five barley loaves, and two fish. You don't have to have some magnificent story, some perfect set of words, or to be living some idea of a perfect life to pick up a basket and start sharing the abundance of God's grace with others. You just don't. Offer what you have. God will work out the multiplication. In our own spiritual lives, we need continual nourishment ourselves. We get it in many ways, but it's also a, an important part of the reason why we come back together so regularly for communion. It's to remember and to receive anew the bread of life that sustains us. And sometimes as Methodists, as Christians in general, it can be hard to talk about our faith in the world. We can see the hunger around us, but it can still feel awkward to talk about how we've found satisfaction, and maybe we're not sure if we're doing it right. But we have all that we need. We have grace upon grace. We have it in abundance, freely given from Jesus Christ. Pick up a basket, feed the world, starting with just one. The invitation is from Christ. Come and eat. There is abundance in the bread of life that satisfies and sustains and heals. Amen.